thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation to, to come and give a talk. Um, I want to tell you about conformal data from critical spin change using periodic MPS and the Coos alert formula. And I prepare notes, so I'll, I'll be using the blackboard mostly, but I'll be going back to the slides whenever I, there is a plot. Um, this is work, uh, where my talk will be basically a summary or an introduction to these two papers. Um, one is just in the archive and the other one got published recently. And this is work with Ash Milstead, who is a postdoc at Perimeter Institute, and also Ijean Zhou, who just started his PhD also at Perimeter Institute. And I want to acknowledge Simon's foundation. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm illegally here. I belong to another Simon's collaboration called the Many, Many Electron Problem Collaboration. Um, and I know that this is enemy territory, but I think you've been very nice so far, so thanks. Um, so what do I want to do? I want to tell you, I have here, I'll start with the motivation, and the motivation will just tell us, or I'll, I'll just remind you of what problem I'm interested in. Basically, I'll have some microscopic Hamiltonian corresponding to a critical system, and I want to extract the conformal data. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is to, to learn about the universal physics of a critical uh, spin chain, starting from the microscopic lattice Hamiltonian. Then um, we'll do that, we'll track conformal data both by looking at low energy spectra, uh, or the low energy spectrum of, of this lattice Hamiltonian, um, and this is based on work by Cardi in the 80s and others, and then we'll go beyond just looking at energies <coughs> and momenta, and we'll look at also how these low energy states are related um, to each other. Uh, so energy eigenstates are just orthogonal to each other, but there is some relation between them, and we'll explore that using uh, the Coase-Solar formula. Um, and finally, I'll discuss, all, all this can be done with exact diagonalization. So Andreas, please pay attention. But uh, you can also go to larger system sizes using matrix product states, where you will have a significant reduction of finite size errors, and that will be also very useful. And finally, if I have time, I've prepared a couple of slides on an application of following uh, a spectral RG flow from one CFT to another working on the lattice. Very good. So let's get started. Uh, maybe I can have this off now. Um, so we're with the motivation. So as I said, our starting point is some, some so we take as an input. We can think of this as a big algorithm, and the input is going to be a critical, critical spin chain Hamiltonian. <coughs> H, and to be concrete, you, this could be your favorite one, which is, I hear, the Eisen model. But the discussion will be fully general for any critical spin chain Hamiltonian. We could apply this, these ideas. Okay? And the output, what we would like is to extract from here is the conformal data, or the crit, you know, we would like the, to characterize the critical universality class of the phase transition, and I'm going to assume that there is some CFT to, to the CFT underlying this, this phase transition, and so this will mean to identify the conformal data of this underlying to the CFT. Okay? Very good. So what do I mean by this conformal data? Well, most of you know this better than I do, but still um, some of you also come from more, so from, from other research areas and maybe it's worth uh, reminding you of what this conformal data is. So, so what we are going to, s to say is that, for instance, if we look at the, ex as at the correlators, ground state two-point correlators um, for this critical system and we identify some local operators suitably in some way that I'm not going to specify, but if we have ability to determine such operators, which correspond to 
quasi-primary fields in the CFT, then we will realize that at least the long times and long distances, they, they behave in a universal way. So we expect some two-point correlator to decay in some characteristic way uh, with distance and time. So it turns out that the correlators, maybe at short distances the, uh, on the spin chain, behave in different ways, but at long times their behavior is completely characterized by this com um, the scaling dimension. And this conformal spin. Okay? And the idea then would be for us to actually extract this data, right? Um, maybe we can just look at two-point correlators at long distances, long times, and, and extract this, this coefficient. Can I ask a question? So in sure. Euclidean, uh, this, this formula is understood where it's supposed to be weighted, but in Minkowski, has it been understood how close to the light cone should you already see this kind of behavior, or should you be far away from the light cone? Right, so, so in the Euclidean case, indeed, you should have a long distance. And in the Lorentzian case, I'm going to assume, I don't know the answer to your question, but I understood the question, which is already remarkable. <laughs> uh, and so you would like to be probably away from the light cone, the, the, the two insertions, right? Because near the light cone, this correlator should diverge, and on the lattice, you won't see any diversion. So that, that already tells you you don't want to be too close to the light cone to see the universal uh, character, at least through this scaling. There might be some other universal characterization there, but I don't know of it. All right. So, so that will be so. So these scaling dimensions and conformal spins are example of conformal data. Uh, specifically, uh, so so there is more to it. Uh, this this would be for quasi-primary fields. And now let me list the, what's the conformal data. So conformal data the minimal amount of information that you need to extract in order to completely characterize this immersion CFT um, would be given by the central charge. C, and this will be some number uh, that would appear in some particular type of correlators for the stress tensor. Um, we would have, also we would like to identify the scaling dimensions and conformal spins for primary fields, and for those who don't know what primary fields are, it's just some subset, some selected subset of quasi-primaries. Um, and then we would like to find also the OPEs, the operator expansion coefficients, um, which control the, the, the three-point correlators, and I'm not going to discuss today. Okay, so the methods that I'll discuss, there is work in progress where we explain how to also find the OPs, but today I will not discuss OPs. So the idea is that uh, we would like to characterize this conformal data if we get these guys, okay? If, if given a microscopic Hamiltonian, we can characterize all these properties, then we have a complete, uh, we have completely characterized the CFT, the underlying CFT, <coughs> okay? So our goal is precisely to get these guys. Input is this spin chain Hamiltonian. Output should be all this. And today I'll focus on, on just this part. OK, any questions? Yeah, sorry. Is it crucial to do Minko? Can you do a click? Because the OP data can be extracted. Uh... Yeah, you can do. The rules of the game is you can do anything you want. But you want to get those. Why don't you prefer to go Euclidean? Where, you know, correlators commute, uh, uh, operators commute, things are, you, are, uh, you don't have these light cone issues. Uh, what is the preference? I don't have a preference. I, I was just tell, saying, you know, this is uh, the meaning of this conformal data in the Lorentzian version, and in the Euclidean version, I would have to write something like that, right? So this will be the correlator, and then some angle here that has to do with, yeah. You're, you're always going to say stuff at real time, in real time. I, I will not even do that. I will get the ground state, low energy states, and, and this will come out of it. 
Uh, are you going to check for conformal invariance in some way? No, uh, I'm, as an input, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that, that the, the critical Hamilton, so I'm taking as input the critical Hamilton, and I won't discuss how to find it, and, okay, which is a good, very important question, how to find a critical Hamiltonian. I'm going to assume that this is the input, and then I'm going to assume also that there is a CFT. Um, but you could, for example, check that phi alpha and phi beta don't overlap if they have different dimensions, even at the two-point function level. Right. I'm not going to build two-point correlators, so maybe that... Oh, you're not going to calculate No, no, no. I'll, I'll just... I wanted to motivate who are these guys. Oh. Right. Okay? Good. I don't have a lot to say, so keep asking. <laughs> Good. So, uh, if there are no more questions, um, done. Um, so, how are we going to obtain this conformal data? One possibility would be to study two-point correlators um, in real time, in Euclidean time. Um, we would need to know who are these scaling operators, and that might be a non-trivial question to identify the scaling operators on the lattice. Um, we may also need to take into account that you know, we cannot study infinite systems. This asymptotic behavior assumes that we, we are on an infinite system, so finite size effects might be important. And there are things you can do by studying correlators, but we're going to use um, another strategy here, which is also has been used in the literature for many years, which was we're going to use the we're going to use the operator state correspondence. And those who know that, please continue to be patient with me. And the others, uh, this is just a statement the local, that the scaling operators in a CFT, scaling operators of this phi alpha, and it doesn't matter whether they are primary, quasi primary, or descendants, or anything, these scaling operators with scaling dimensions and conformal spins, they are in one to one correspondence to, to uh, states on the circle. So what I'm saying is you put your CFT on a circle, right? This space, this is space, you can imagine this is a cylinder with time going vertically. This would be time or tau if you prefer Euclidean time. And here we have space. And the, the idea is, is that there will be some Hamiltonian, some momentum operator. Hamiltonian generates translations in time, momentum generates translations in space, and these guys commute, you can simultaneously diagonalize them, and then you can get the energy eigenstates, okay? Um, and these energy eigenstates come with energies and momenta, the eigenvalues by these two operators, which happen to be directly related to the scaling dimensions and the conformal spins that we are interested in, okay? So, what this, this scaling dimension will be two, so if, if this direction here is ha has space has size L, it's going to be 2L scaling dimension minus C over 12, C being the central charge, and the momentum <laughs> is 2 pi L um, times the conformal spin. So here's a trick. You can use the operator state <coughs> correspondence to, instead of studying two-point correlators, just directly try to study a lattice version of this, of the, of the CFT put on a circle, okay? Then you lo look at low energy states, uh, or you look at, at energies and momenta, you diagonalize the Hamiltonian and the momentum operator, and you can read off from the circle the scaling dimensions and conformal spins from the energies and momenta, okay? And that's a standard, you know, that's very well understood piece of theory. And the only thing we're gonna do now is a lattice version of this. Okay, so in the lattice, we'll put n spins, okay, and then we'll have some, some lattice Hamiltonian, H, some momentum Hamiltonian, uh, so, sorry, well, we'll have some translation operator T, so, uh, and in this case, uh, we'll, we can diagonalize these guys and we'll get that the energies and the, um, and the moment again, I'll, I'll relate these guys, in a second, so let maybe let me call this energies in the CFT. Okay, and if I don't say CFT, it means on the lattice. Then these guys are basically there are a couple of normalization um, microscopic 
constants to be determined here, but the rest is very similar. Um, so So what we have is that at least at the low energies, the, the spectrum of energies on the lattice of this spin chain okay, will have up to some a couple of non-universal constants, will have that the energies are organized again according to the scaling dimensions, and the momenta is organized again according to the so scaling dimensions and conformal spin. It's a, I don't see the, the correction term for delta alpha is what delta alpha minus C over... Over 12. And here, this was C over 12. So that's still the universal part, right? So what's not universal here, what's lattice dependent, is this normalization constants and the subleading corrections. But the, the leading corrections in, in 1 over the system size, 1 over n, are universal. Well, they, they, all, they all work the same for all the states, except that we don't have a normalization here. Yes? So what I'm saying is, on the left-hand side, except for these guys that we <coughs> need to take care of, the rest is, is, is universal. And on the, on the left-hand side, we have data that comes directly from diagonalizing your spin chain. So this is la lattice or numerical data, and you can extract all these universal properties from that. OK? So are there questions? Why is B UV sensitive from sensitive to lattice physics? Because when, when they give you Hamiltonian, the Ising model, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, my fa favorite Ising model Hamiltonian comes with a factor two there. Oh. And now we could argue forever who. <laughs> I actually think it's a two, but. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so you need, yeah, th there is some. some and, and then this one is just shifting all the energies. Okay, very good. But th that's important, yes. The speed of light. That's exactly right. So, so we need to, to identify what's the speed of light in your lattice system, and then with that information you fix this and you remove that guy. Very good. So, uh, and, and, and this has been known forever, so these are techniques that were developed uh, following work by Cardi in the 80s, right? And this is a typical way of extracting conformal data from a spin chain. This has been done by many people over the years. I, I think, uh, Andreas, did you mention this? in? I think you had some plots. There was one slide. And right. <laughs> Very good. So, so now, um, what I would like to do is, is to, to go a bit beyond this. Uh, so again, let, sorry, let me mention this. So what we, we could do is, given your Hamiltonian, you identify the eigenstates on the lattice okay, of the Hamiltonian momentum. So, so this, these guys will have these energies. And you don't have a momentum, in principle, defined on the lattice, but you have translations by one side, and so <coughs> you choose, you diagonalize the Hamiltonian with states that are invariant under translations, and so they fulfill this. Okay? That under translation, you just, they just spit out, uh, spit out the phase, and this is, from this phase we extract the momentum. So there is some, you know, this is not well defined, it's defined up to 2 pi, whatever. Okay, so, so, so let me show you a couple of things you can do with that. Can I have the, the slides here? All right, so, so this would be the prediction from CFT. Just this is exact data. If you diagonalize your CFT on a circle, um, on the axis you have momentum and, and energy or directly scaling dimensions and conformal spins. And what you should recognize here are the conformal towers of um, the identity in blue. So there is, uh, you know, this would be energy zero or scaling dimension zero and, and, and momentum zero. And then in blue, you see all these blue dots. These are the descendants of the identity. You see the stress tensor or states that correspond through the operator state correspondence to the stress tensor T, T bar, T, T bar. Um, then you have two more. Uh, towers the, the, the spin, okay, in orange, and all its descendants, and then the energy density or epsilon um, in, in green, and all the descendants, okay? Um, and, and, you know, we use, we spread the numbers around the x axis a little bit just to show degeneracy, but of course the momenta are quantized or the scaling dimensions. So all, all, 
all these guys, all these four guys should be on top of each other and we just spread them and they should have a spin uh, one, two, three, four, five, but we spread them because we can, right? Because there is no ambiguity there, okay? So this is what the CFT tells you that you would find. Uh, and if you do that on the lattice, uh, you have something that looks very similar. So this would be for system of 64 spins. Um, if you diagonalize for the, crit the, the criticalizing model, this, this Hamiltonian here, if you diagonalize it on 64 spins, you would get this spectrum. And this spectrum is not identical, but the differences have the, well, the, you, what you can see here is that low energies come very accurately. There are numbers attached to that. But I even from the, the, this, the, this figure, you already see that the departure from, from, from the exact solution is more clear as you go up in energies, okay? So it's uh, at low energies, you get high accuracy or high correspondence numerically, um, quantitatively, and as you go up in energies, this gets spoiled, and this is because of these subleading corrections. Yeah? It doesn't mean like your lattice cutoff, doesn't mean that there's also a cutoff in spin that you can measure? Um, if you keep going, uh, you know, uh, this, this, this is uh, th this is what I mentioned, right? That on the lattice, your your spin, <laughs> well, on a final lattice, if you have sufficiently large momentum, then it goes around, and so you cannot distinguish uh, p from p plus two pi, and well, this, this type of thing, or in this case, so it's spin spin and spin plus sixty four or something would be right. the same. Right, right, that right, that right. So so. We, we stop plotting these things because it's hard, you know, these are 64 spins, so if, and this is the Isaac model, but we didn't use that it's the Isaac model. It's an arbitrary spin chain, we can, we can plot something like this, right? So there is some comp computational cost attached to, to getting all these states. And so you have to stop somewhere. But once you see that this is not exactly degenerate, you say, okay, data is being <coughs> corrupted by finite size effects and you, it's okay to stop there. So here you didn't do any extrapolation in any, just did n equals 64. This is n equal to 64. To the equations without the error. No, no, no attempts to, to, you know, to polish the data so that yeah, it's more impressive or anything. That's, that's what you get. Okay? So, so then what? Um, so this is literally for this transverse field. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, and we, could an integrable yeah, we could use free fermions <laughs> and get, you get more. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but we didn't use that. That's, that's the point. Um, so, so that's always the danger of, of, of when you use the Ising model as a simple toy model to illustrate things that they will tell you, oh, but we can do that, uh, you know, using free fermions, sure. Um, so, so, so I, I have a slide to find that. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so let's be more modest. Let's take uh, 14 spins. So let's use exact diagonalization. And before Andreas correctly claims, oh, I can go to beyond, beyond 14 spins. Yes, but I only had my laptop. <laughs> okay? So, so this is, you know, I could go to, well, I could not. Andreas could go to 30, 40, 40 spins, 50? Ha! <laughs> 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 well, I don't know. Overnight, maybe he found a trick. Uh, anyway, so, so let's, let's, let's have a hard, um, you know, upper bound on, on how large the system can be. And then you'll find, you can analyze the Hamiltonian using these well-established techniques. Uh, and, and what you get is, is this, this momenta versus energies, okay? And it's cute. Uh, and I also added some labels because I knew in advance that this was the energy, the, the state corresponding to, well, the ground state corresponds to the entity operator. The, the, the first excited state is the sigma, the, this guy is the epsilon, so I, I had some information, so I added that there, okay? Just for reference. But what you can see is that the, the data is already significantly less well behaved, and also, a priori, when you get this plot, you don't know who are the primaries. And remember, we are trying to get not just scaling dimensions and conformal spins, but those corresponding to the primaries, okay? So we will need to work a little bit to generic, for a generic Hamiltonian to understand who are the primaries and who are not. Was that a question? This one? Yeah, how do you distinguish Good, I will answer that, maybe. <laughs> so so the qu two questions are first, how do we manage to paint, right, to color all these, all these dots? How do we go from here to here? 
Okay? How do we understand that there are conformal, who, who belongs to the same conformal tower? Right? So on the lattice, what you have really is a list of eigenstates. If you take the overlap between them, they are zero if they are different eigenstates, and that seems to be it. That's the story uh, that you could na naively uh, explain. So we want to go beyond that, and we want to say that whatever eigenstate cor corresponding to this, this dot here, say the ground state, and this other eigenstate corresponding to, say, the stress tensor, that they are related in some way. Okay, we would like to be able to, to do that. That's one thing we would like to do, and the other thing is that we would like to to be able to, to scale this up a little bit so that we can get more eigen, eigenvectors um, beyond what exact normalization could do. <coughs> and then I want to uh, show you a plot of what happens with more complicated Hamiltonians so that you can see that this is fully general and why it's, I it's then suddenly non-trivial. So this will be the three-state POTS model. Um, this will be, again, the CFT data coming from CFT, so that would be the exact uh, scaling dimensions and conformal spins. And this is the type of data after painting, after coloring. Okay? You can see, for instance, that if they give you just these dots and they ask you, okay, where are the primaries? I, I don't know how you would get that there is a primary up here. Okay? It's highly non-trivial. You, you really have all this data, all these eigenvalues, eh? um, conformal spins and, and energies. And it's, uh, sometimes you can say, well, you know, there is some microscopic symmetry, right? <laughs> Z3 or, or in the Asimov Z2 or whatever, you can use that to say, oh, the spin is the, f the lowest energy state with odd, um, it, which is odd under Z2. Okay? So yes, you can get some, for specific models where there are microscopic symmetries, you can get some information out of those. But, but you need much more uh, to identify all, all primaries. Okay? So this is an example of, of uh, I mean, you can get many more states, but we just focus on, on on some subset, this is the three-state POTS model with periodic boundary conditions. If you put anti-periodic boundary conditions, you will get other sectors of the CFT. Uh, and basically, you can scan all the, all the primaries <laughs> in this way. Okay. All, all the multiplicities are correct, at least. The multiplicities? Yes. There's no missing. Right. Yes. But uh, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that, yes, that you can play around with partial information, such as symmetries, multiplicities. But that's generically not enough to determine who are the primaries. And you need to do more. Okay? And I want to explain what, what this more is. Very good. And so what, what notes, notes here? Where am I? Done. OK. So, so the next step then, um, I think we can leave this on for a second, because uh, I'll use it again in a minute. But I want to go to this Kuhn-Salor formula, which will be the key, the key to be able to color all this again, uh, all this data. Okay, so I think it's number three, Kuhn-Salor. I think you guys know this, uh, Hubert-Salor. Um, and so what what we want to say now is that um, well, that in a CFT. There is some Virasoro algebra, right? You have generators of, of this symmetry, infinite dimensional symmetry group, conformal group. Um, there are very interesting expressions. If you are familiar with them, you don't need to watch them. If you are not familiar with them, you don't need to watch them either. That's why I just, you know, yeah. instead of writing them, I mean, there is some, some, some algebraic structure uh, supporting all these emergent symmetry that you can see on the lattice. Uh, and the question uh, is, well, uh, and the point is that this, these operators, they act as ladder operators on the low energy spectrum or on the spectrum of the CFT. And so if we had access to such operators, th these operators connect different um, eigenstates. Okay? And they connect them, eigenstates that will be connected by these operators will correspond, will belong to the same conformal tower. Conformal tower, actually, it's an irreducible representation and the, the action of these guys. Okay, so, so the idea is it would be great if we had somehow a way of having a lattice version of these Virasoro operators. Okay? That, that would be great because that's the type of objects on the lattice that we would use to act on these energy eigenstates, low energy eigenstates on the lattice, and the result would be some other eigenstates on the same tower. 
Okay? So I wish I had a Latin representation of these guys. And that's ac actually what the Kusselor formula does for us. Okay? So, so if you want as motivation, not... It's a simpler version of this question just for like global conformal part of the group. <laughs> Like it would be nice to understand if there is a latest version of P mu, which there seems to be. So if you if you can strike out some global group descendants out of the table, you, you can would also already be you okay. would already be like halfway. Right, and in higher dimensions, that's all that you expect. Yes. So the answer is we can do everything, and a subset of everything is what you ask. Before you do everything, <laughs> can you explain something like? That simple <laughs> question, does it have a simple answer or you have to go through Kusa learning in that case? I, I think it's the same motivation. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the stress tensor on the lattice. And from there you can build all the generators, global or, or, or mm, Mirasoro. So, so then the, uh, instead of telling you directly Kusa formula what it is, I'm just going to go back and try to understand the first part, right, where we say oh, in the low energy, uh, you know, you take the lattice Hamiltonian, you diagonalize it, and you start extracting uh, energies and, and momenta, which correspond to scaling dimensions and conformal spin. So wh what's happening there? Well, what's happening is very simple. We have some Hamiltonian of the CFT, which is nothing but an integral over the circle of some Hamiltonian density for the CFT. Okay? And what we're seeing is that somehow this acts or there is some correspondence on the lattice with some, some Hamiltonian on the lattice. But the Hamiltonian on the lattice is not one big piece. It's a sum of local terms. Okay? So maybe, maybe the same way that we've been able to look at you know, this guy and see that the spectrum is analogous to this guy, how about we just look at these two guys? and conjecture that maybe they are related, okay? So how about, you know, m as motivation, right? Maybe H, the local Hamiltonian term in your Hamiltonian, can be equated to the H, the energy density on the CFT. And remember that this is, this is nothing but the stress tensor T of X plus T bar of X, okay? So, that, that was actually our motivation, and then later we discovered that this had a name, and it's called Kusselor formula because um, Cohen Sellers did this in, I think, '94 um, for some integrable models. And our <laughs> proposal was we we were not aware of this, but now we 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 quickly adjusted to reality. We call it the Kusselor formula. But the idea is this was originally motivated for integrable models, but we are just going to use it for a generic model, right? In a generic model, they'll give you a lattice Hamiltonian, which is some of lo local terms. And now we're going to take a local term and going to think of it and manipulate it as if it was a lattice representation of T plus T bar. I'm sorry, why do you need, uh, isn't this just the usual RG? You take a local operator on the lattice, you're supposed to match it on whatever continuous limit operators which have the same quantum numbers, and that's the leading term in that matching. That's the usual RG, Wilson formula. Are you saying this is going to work? I don't... That formula definitely is very natural. Good. Good. I also like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is, the question is this... You know. present it as if it, we don't know if it's going to work. Right. It's guaranteed to work. I, I wanted to make it more exciting, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see you very excited. Um, <laughs> that's okay. So, so basically the summary is that we've been using Cardi's formula from the 80s to death, and we've not been using this, which was there, and conceptually it's, you know, it's a tiny step to take from, you know, instead of equating this to that, you just equate the densities, right? And yes, it's absolutely natural. And uh, all I'm saying is, if you use that, you can color your your low energy spectra. Okay? So it's it's I agree with you. It's extremely natural. And before we discovered that this was Kusselor, that it had even a name, 
we were very excited, but we were wondering why is that people have not been using this? Because it's, it's just a very natural thing to do. Yeah. Okay. So I agree with you that this is not even exciting. Um, all right. So, so, so then what, what do we want to do? We have this Virasora algebra. And, and interestingly, what, what, what do, in practice, what do we need to do to start playing the game of identifying who is the, you know, the identity? Or how, how do we start identifying primaries and quasi-primaries and so on? Well, what we need to know, or, or first let me, let me just define the object that we will be, the only object we will need, it's going to be HN. Okay, I'm going to define HN as, I'm going to take Fourier modes of the Hamiltonian term here. So sum over the lattice sides from 1 to n <coughs> of e to the i j small n 2 pi over n. So I'm just taking um, this Hamiltonian term here, 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 here. I'm adding them but putting a face. Okay? I'm going to call this Hn. And the Hamiltonian, actually H0, would be equal to a renormalized version of the Hamiltonian on the lattice. Okay? So if you don't put phases, you still have this term here. So these are the Fourier modes of the Hamiltonian, something that you can easily build on the lattice. And now all we need to understand wow, another one, is how they act on, on, uh, on the CFT states. And then, you know, I do the same on the lattice. Okay. So what do we need to know? Uh, let's, um, let's see what's the next. Oh yeah, I'm going to use this one. So it turns out that on the CFT side, this is again exact CFT data, not spin chain. You can use these LNs to move around. And for instance, as an example, um, if you start from the ground state, identity state, and you apply L minus two bar, you would, oh, I didn't, yeah, the L bars, L's and L bars before, this will allow us to move around, okay? Um, and how, what's the relation between the LNs and the, and the HNs that we just defined? Uh, so that's, sorry, I lost this, it's, it's somewhere. Oh, I have it here, okay, so, so even at the level of CFT, the HN, is nothing but L over 2 pi integral of dx, and then you fully transform this on the circle. And then you put the Hamiltonian density of the CFT. But now we just need to remember that this is t plus t bar. Okay? And, and then you can end up rewriting this as this generator's ln, with a sort of generator's ln, an L minus N bar um, minus C over 12 delta N zero. Okay? So basically having access to this HN is very close to having access to the LNs. Okay? Now, the good news is that this LN with positive N when acting on states lowers the energy, whereas the minus, minus N for positive N <coughs> will um, increase the energy, okay? So, so if you go with HN on, on some state, or eigen state, the result, the result will be, of course, LN um, on this state plus L minus N bar on this state, maybe some identity contribution. But the point is that, that this part here has lower energy. And this part here has higher energy. So it doesn't really matter that you don't have access independently to ln and l minus n bar. You just have access to a gen because when you act with a gen, you can quickly determine which part comes, you know, it, it's, it's, you just look at this, this, the result of this action will be states with higher energy or with lower energy and states with higher energy. And you just split the two contributions, and you know that you that this is if you were acting with ln or l minus n bar. Okay, so we could make a big effort to build the momentum operator 
which corresponds to 2 minus 2 bar, but we don't even need that for, for, for today. Okay? So we could try to find also the momentum operator on the lattice, the momentum density operator on the lattice, but we won't even need that. Because when act this, this combination, t plus t, the one coming from t, t plus t bar, will be enough for all the purposes of today. Okay. So then we, c we are very close. Oh, but it's late. Do they have an interesting algebra, these HNs? Uh, it follows from the other one. Uh, sure, but does it close on, on, the, on itself? Uh, oh, um, no, I don't think it closes. <coughs> no, I think that, uh, let's see. Um, no, because, yeah, the minus, so these two guys don't talk to each other, but this minus one, this minus sign here will include, a, will, will put a relative minus between the two. Yeah, I don't think they close. Another question which connects to what Slav was asking before, so are these HN exactly the spectrum generating operators, or are there small corrections? There are, there are always finite size corrections on the lattice. Is that what you're asking? No. On uh, I mean, you, re you construct some states on the lattice, and yes. are these H and precisely the operators that link these states, or are there some... Oh, yeah, that is what you're saying. There are finite size corrections. There are finite size corrections. Yeah. Yes. And so it's important to go to large system sizes to see whether these finite size corrections go decrease or increase with system size. So whether it's an artifact of... Well, whether there is something serious happening there, or it's just a finite size effect. Yes. That's why it's important to go beyond exact analyzation at some point. Good. So, so, okay. So, so, what do I want? I, I mean, I, now I, I, I could state many things, but maybe I'll just say, to yeah, I'll try to 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 move quickly s through this. So, what's a primary state? Okay. If we have a primary state, well, it turns out that that it's a state that is annihilated by all the LNs and LN bars. For all n, um, what is it? Uh, for n larger than than zero, okay. So that would be a characterization from the CFT side, and you can see that actually you only need to check for n one and two. Uh, this is enough. The rest follows from from conformal from the Virasoro algebra. So we would like to check that. And now what we're going to do is well, you can actually show that that's the same as putting the h's here, okay? H um, so if this happens for n equal to plus minus 1 and plus minus 2, that, that the low energy part is equal to 0, so lower energy. Okay? What I'm saying is you can take this understood, well understood conditions, what's a primary state, you can re-express them in terms of, of how they are related, how, how they behave under the action of the agents. Okay? And you need h1, h minus 1, h 2 and h minus 2. So only four of those Fourier modes. And then you can, you can just go to your states and ask the question, uh, what happens, for instance, if I apply um, h1 and 2 to this guy, there is no other state at lower energy, <coughs> so this, this could only be a primary, but you can ask the question for other states and, and you can answer. Right? If, you, if by acting with h1, h2, h minus 1, h minus 2, on a state, there is nothing being created at lower energies, that's a primary. Okay? If you do that only with the ones, that's a quasi-primary, and so on. Okay? So there are well-known and well-understood facts from CFT that translate into a criterion on the lattice to identify all these guys. And then, and then once you identify the primaries, you can also identify all the descendants by just acting with uh, these agents. Now you look at the higher <coughs> energy contribution. Good. So, and, and you can do weird things. I mean, on the lattice, you are not promised that y you, you wouldn't know who are the descendants of the stress tensor, the, uh, uh, but, but actually, uh, yeah, you, you can determine this to high accuracy. All right. So I'm running out of, no, I'm not running out of time. I'm running out of paper. Uh, no, oh yeah, no, actually I forgot the most important part. Uh, so, how, so we would like to go to larger system sizes. And so what, how are we going to do this? And that's the section four. I have to say it was fantastic to work with uh, exact diagonalization. 
because you really can already see lots of this. You can demonstrate all these ideas with exact generalization. So it's not, oh, you need matrix public states or any other fancy technique to start using this, right? So you can incorporate, if you are <coughs> using exact generalization, you can incorporate all these ideas. Um, but eventually, you want to go beyond exact generalization. So now I want to use a matrix product state. And let me make some bold statement here. I'm going to say that if exact generalization, depending on your laptop or you, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to say we can go typically to 30 spins. Uh, OK, 40. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, no, you were not smiling. Uh, now you are. So here. Uh, you know, we can easily go to 500 spins, okay? Now, this is going to be matrix product state in a challenging environment. So, this is going to be matrix product states with periodic boundary conditions or in a periodic chain, okay? And that means that the cost of the algorithm is not the usual one, it's more expensive. So, let me first define the ansatz. So, our wave function will have all these many coefficients that we will just write as a tensor network as a matrix product state and then we have periodic boundary conditions we will for the ground state let's first consider ground state so this is uh, just a quick summary of what you need to do to go to 500 spins okay and we'll proceed sequentially instead of taking the hamilton and spitting out all the eigenvectors um, we start with building the ground state and then we'll proceed more in a s quantum field theory fashion in which you, once you have the ground state, you can build excitations on top, local excitations on top. Okay? So first we need to write the ground state and the ground state will be described by this tensor network where each tensor uh, has dimension chi, chi here the physical dimension say equal to 2 for, for spin 1 half for the IC model. And, and this one dimension will, in the examples that the plots that I'll show, uh, ran, ranges between 24 and 36. So this is small compared to the brutalities that nowadays can do with open boundary conditions. You can put this equal to 10,000. You know. Okay, so we're going to have, this would be with open boundary conditions, that's the state of the art calculations. I've heard of 40,000 and more, and that's very nice, but um, in periodic boundary conditions, we will be using uh, an algorithm with a cost. So, so let's see. Uh, let, let me do this uh, carefully. So memory, how much does it take to store the, gr the ground state wave function? Well, um, we, t we, we have to store one of these tensors, right? We have n copies of this tensor, but they are the same. And somebody made the observation that you don't need to store them n times. So that uh, gave us speed up. Okay, that's a joke. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so this is how the memory scales. Okay, this is the no com number of complex coefficients we have to store in the computer with chi of this order. So this is really very small requirement. Okay, in memory, and then time. This is the bottleneck. Time scales. The computational time scales as the fifth power times some d to some power, okay? So this is the, the bottleneck. This has to be compared with MPS in open boundary conditions where this thing will be chi to the three, to the third power. So this chi to the third power allows you to go to very large bond dimensions um, because we have the fifth power, we cannot go to the same uh, huge bond dimension. Yeah, one question, <coughs> if you use open boundary conditions, you don't have translational invariance anymore. So do you need to store more tensors? Right? Yes. So open boundary condition is worse for memory? Um, it could be worse for memory. It could be better for, for time. It, it's not better for time, but it could in principle. Um, but then you will lose the well-defined momenta, right? So, so th this, this guy is guaranteed to be translational invariant by at the level of the ansatz. So the variational class is already translational invariant. If you lose that, you may regret it later when you look at excitations. All the excitations that we're going to get have well-defined momentum as well. And you want to build them from an exactly translation invariant ground state. Yes. 
Yeah. Can, can you use these HNs to help you calculate the ground state? I mean, the lattice HNs, the fact that you know that they're supposed to annihilate the ground state. Right. Th that's a very good question. The attitude we take here, so the answer is I don't know, and we don't need it. So the attitude we take is we use well-understood techniques to find the low-energy spectra, and then we use the HNs to relate the spectra, not to find the spectra. But in, indeed, once you have, say, the ground state, you could uh, start acting with the agents and build descendants, mm -hmm. right? But the, the point is we don't need to do that because we, we have alternative ways. So we'll just use the agents mm -hmm. to relate eigenstates obtained in, uh, using other methods. Okay? Good. So, so anyway, so there was some, some technical... How do, you, how do you do that relation? Do you take your low energy eigenstates that you've constructed and then apply the agents? And then check overlaps or something, or yeah. is that what you do? That's that's that. Yeah. Okay. And now I was giving you some hint on how we find the ground state. There is a variational ansatz. You know, if you are not into variational ansatz, <coughs> just uh, I'm giving you some minimal technical description here. We can use energy minimization, so you can compute the ground state, the, the, the expectation value of the energy by this ansatz, and then start tweaking the variational parameters so that you can lower the energy. And there are very powerful and well understood techniques to do that. Well, well understood, no, they work. Um, uh, so, so we use gradient descent. And okay. And once we have that, an important aspect of this is that the, we, we, we will define some excited states by in a, in a tricky way. So, so it's, you can think of this as, as block, MPS block states. Okay, so now we have the ground state, and now we're going to build um, the excited states by taking the same tensor everywhere as in the ground state, so we don't have to compute it again. But in one location, we'll put a new tensor in just one location, L, okay? And that's not yet the answer for the ground state, the, for the excited state. But I want you to, to first look at this and recognize that what we're doing is we take the ground state wave function and we modify it only in one location. Ten minutes. Okay. Um, so so <coughs> by modifying this tensor, we're not changing the wave function in one point. There are correlations here that spread around. And so you could think of this as modifying the ground state everywhere, but the modifications decay away from the, the, the place where you, you modify your ansatz, okay? So that's, that's the basic ingredient. And then all we have to do is we take linear combinations of, of this modified MPS on one side. We, we take the same guy and we translate it. So we are summing over L, right? The, w the place, we take a linear combination of modified ground states where we consider modifying it here, or here, or here, or here. That's what the sum is about. And we just put some 2 pi over n um, L times some, some p, and that defines your psi of... So, so this is your variational class for an excited state with momentum p. Okay? It it bring it has the the momentum p built in, so it's an exact uh, eigenstate of the momentum operator. And the question is whether it's a, also an exact or approximately an an, an eigenstate <laughs> of also of of the energy. And that's what you determine again uh, no, uh, variationally. So you have this variational class where the ground state has zero momentum by construction, and you just look at how to lower the energy. And the excited state you choose in e every momentum sector. Right, you choose the momentum sector, and within that momentum sector, you optimize V so that you get the first, the lowest energy state, the first excited state, and so on. Okay, I, I think that at the high-level summary, this is all that is that can be said. In are, are, are there issues about missing certain excited states ever? Very good. So it turns out that this, if this was a gap system, in a gap system, this would be the single particle, single quasi-particle. Excited states. So you will be missing a scattering states. You will be missing states that correspond to having two excitations colliding. Okay. 
So the surprise, and then a posteriori, oh no, we understand everything, blah, 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 is that this, this is enough to capture all the excited states in a CFT. Okay? And that, um, that to understand this, I, I, I don't have a, well, the claim is that this works and there are, you know, strong numerical evidence supporting this claim. But the full understanding, I don't know, I can argue, right? I'm going to start arguing, well, you know, this guy is centered here, but, but in this wave function, the correlations, this is a critical ground state, so correlations go around the system, no problem. So it's not that you are only modifying the wave function on this point or within, you know, a, a, na a finite <coughs> neighborhood of it, okay? It's not that you have a correlation length and, and, and therefore this modification only affects the wave function within a correlation length. You do not have a correlation length. It's the correlation length is as large as the system. Okay? So that would be that would be an argument to say this, this ansatz is more powerful than the single excitation ansatz that you would think in a gap system. This is one. Well, I guess I'm thinking of solitonic states where to the left and the right of B you might want different tensors. Um, <coughs> uniform, but right. Uh, the question is: Is do you have quasi particles in a CFT? Depends on who you talk to. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So, am I talking to someone who would say yes or no? <laughs> 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 because if you say yes, there are, then I say okay. Yeah, so, I so okay. So, so <laughs> then, then, yeah, okay. So I don't, I, I can, I don't, I cannot fight that uh, with logic, but I can. Bring in some psychological pressure. Uh, uh, okay, so. Sorry, question. Yeah. Uh, in this way, I mean, if you do a variation on that, for every momentum, you just focus on one state. For every momentum, I focus on a tower of states. Uh, no, no, uh, but, but variation gives you the lowest one. R right, that, right. Oh, very good, very good. So, so, yeah, you can imagine that instead of just getting, first you get the lowest one, yes. and then you ask, what is the next guy orthogonal to the lowest one? Uh, you just simple orthogonalization. I'm asking, this works, you mean? If this works. Okay, because that's also numerically non trivial that it's going to work. Okay. Very good. Right. Okay, so so this works, this works, this works. What does it mean? Uh, I don't know. Okay, this works. Um, so so the plot I showed you at the beginning was just to show you that we could get um, the right energies and momenta for lots of low energy states. And if we want to go quantitatively, then we have that, you know, the scaling dimensions have to do with the energy, accuracy and the energy. Now we, we allow for extrapolation. This, th in system size, so this goes from, I don't know, up to 228 uh, sites. And if you ask me why 228, that's exactly the question I asked the student. Uh, uh, but, you know, they, they decided 228 was their matching number. Um, so there is nothing special about this number, I'm hoping. Um, and then the one dimension to increase them up to 36, which is very, very modest. Um, and you can get, uh, I didn't explain how to compute the central charge, I won't do it now. Uh, but you can get this, this, you know, these are the exact results, and then you can get um, five, six digits of accuracy. Um, as you go up in the energy, the accuracy drops, but you still get four digits, which is pretty decent. But I have a question on the uh, extrapolation, because this is finite size extrapolation, but there is also finite chi error. Yes. And, and since there is no length scale in the problem, I expect the energy of all these states will, will have a one over chi correction. Right, we, we don't play this game? So you should, for the every size, you should first extrapolate yes. with chi, yes, yes. and then do the finite size extrapolation. No? Yes. That, that's been done in there. So the error is probably much bigger than that, because of the finite chi. I mean, the, the relative error you... I don't think this is the one you could okay. It's surprising that it's so small. <laughs> but it's a small sense of time. I don't know where you were going. Oh, five minutes, okay. But, but then it would, I mean, the num number of states that you need to keep would grow exponentially with C. Probably. Yeah. So then C, C equals to one half is nice. Yeah. There are negative Cs mm -hmm. there, out there. Yeah. No, so indeed, um, this, the performance of the algorithm, as any other algorithm, depends on the model you, you attack. And the ISIM model is particularly, it's, it's very nice. There are very small finite size corrections, um, which are well understood. It, they come from some irrelevant term that has <coughs> some dimension four or something. Um, uh, if you try more <coughs> uh, tougher models, then you will see a general uh, decay of, of accuracies and so on. 
but um, yeah, that's what it is. So, so the question is, throw your best method into the IC model and look how it compares. And I, I've said that because it, you know, we come out nice. Uh, I mean, th this uh, I've been I've been looking at different methods for for a few years now, and, and these these are on the top. Uh, yeah, they compare very well with any uh, with the best of available methods. Um, and this this is you know laptop computation. We haven't made any effort to parallelize the code or to go to use powerful machines. Um, and again, there are, you know, we could go to 500 spins, so why did we stop there? I don't know. Um, so so you, you can see all this type of accuracy. So there is not just a quantitative, uh, qualitative uh, you know, understanding that, this, that, the, um, that, that, that we're getting the, the low energies correctly, but actually it's, it's highly accurate. Okay? Good, so I had five minutes, five minutes ago, or how was it? You have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So we can do I can tell you about an application, just I flash it around. I, I, I prepare slides for that part, knowing that I would come here in trouble with time, um, of what you can do with this beyond trying to <coughs> solve again the IZ model, which is always fun. So application, I'm going to just use these techniques to study um, spectral energy flow. What By spectral energy flow, I mean is that I'm going to look at low energy states on a spin chain, on a circle, as I increase the system size. And I'm going to start with a Hamiltonian that is close to the tricritical, tricriticalizing CFT, <coughs> but has a relevant perturbation that will flow as we increase the system size, will flow to the criticalizing model. Okay? So I'm going to I want to, to play a game where I, I see something like this, right? I flow at, from the UV, I have the tricriticalizing model, some central charge larger than one half, flowing down in the IR to a central charge equal to one half. But instead of doing the RG thing of re, re, you know, uh, having an effective Hamiltonian as I change scale, that I change the couplings and so on, I'm just going to start with a fixed Hamiltonian and I'm just going to look at different system sizes for the same Hamiltonian. So what's going to happen is, at small system sizes, what's going to happen now, what happens is that at small system sizes, the, the Hamiltonian, the low energy spectrum of the Hamiltonian looks like this. Okay? This is after diagonalizing for 24 sites, okay, using um, color. So we use all these techniques to identify who are the primaries, who are the descendants. And then we can compare to the tricriticalizing model, and we see, okay, this is actually um, not exactly the same spectrum, but when we try to identify primaries, they actually work in, the, in exactly what, uh, what you, you have, you, you can reconstruct the map. So you can recognize the tricriticalizing CFT on this spin chain. And I have to say there is a parameter here, gamma equal to 10, okay, for the initial Hamiltonian. This, this is a very special and nice Hamiltonian that we use for, for this application. This Hamiltonian here is the Ising Hamiltonian times a perturbation or an extra term where this term it actually takes a, a extreme value 247 roughly speaking so it's not an exact value here for this to become the tricriticalizing CFT. Okay? It's, it's, this model is nice because this perturbation conserves the Z2 symmetry of the Ising model but also it's Kammer's Vanier self dual as the criticalizing model. And so this locks you, all the perturbations that you can have are irrelevant with respect to the criticalizing model. Okay? So, so this is an irrelevant perturbation with respect to the criticalizing model. So we, it, you know, this, this, would f this flows back to the Ising model okay? at long distances. But it turns out that, that if we tune it to a value of this order, then it becomes a tricriticalizing model. So, so you're guaranteed to flow to a CFT and not to a gapped phase? Is it? It's guaranteed to flow back to the criticalizing model because in the critical, at least perturbatively, in the criticalizing model you have two possible relevant terms. The spin, which is odd, and the Z2 symmetry, so the, the Z2 symmetry kills that possibility. And then the energy density, the epsilon, which is uh, odd and the kramers vanier duality. And since this is self-dual, you also kill that. Okay, so you, you are guaranteed to, you have killed all the relevant, possible relevant perturbations of the criticalizing model, and so whatever you add, or this, this perturbation, 
right, is irrelevant with respect to the critical Isaac model. Oh, sorry, I thought that actually uh, 1,3 degenerate field relevant deformation, depending on the sign of the perturbation, actually can flow to either like IR CFT or massive phase. Sorry, which which perturbation on what? So uh, it's, I think it's exactly the perturbation you're looking at. Uh, it was like worked out by John Logical that depending on the sign of the perturbation, you can actually flow either to massive phase or like conform fixed point. N not not from the IZ model. If you look at this as a perturbation of the IZ model, that's oh, not. It's no. a as a perturbation of the azimuth. Oh, Maybe the question here, if gamma is bigger than 247, yeah. That's right. Uh, then, then you have, yes, 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 oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. So, so then what we can do is, is we can study th this, the same Hamiltonian, right, for gamma equal to 10. Maybe, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's remarkable that so far away from 247, it still remembers, uh, for small system size, it still remembers the tricritical tri azimuth model. Okay, but it does. And this is the numerical evidence of it. That's the exact spectrum. This is the spectrum on the lattice for 24 sites. But when you try to relate these guys using the agents, they, they still know about the, the CFT. And then you take the same microscopic Hamiltonian and you put it in a larger system size, larger, larger, larger. And by the time you get to 200, uh, 128 sites, you get this spectrum. Okay? And this spectrum, um, low energy spectrum, again, you apply <coughs> the same agents now on more sites, okay? but they are built from the same microscopic Hamiltonian. And now they have a different identification. They, they give you these uh, conformal towers, which correspond to the criticalizing model. And in between, in between what you can do is, is you can just, uh, so let, let me show, tell you what this is. Now we, we select a few of the energy spectra of the energy um, eigenvalues as a function of the system size, so 1 over n squared. So this means this is uh, a small system size, and in this direction you increase the system size. Okay? And you follow the low energy spectrum on the circle, and you see that on, on one extreme you would have that these energy levels correspond to some local operators on the tricritical IG model. And on this side, the, the continuation of these eigenvalues or eigenvectors correspond to a different set of scaling operators on, on the critical IZMO. And so we have a nice way of relating scaling operators from one CFT to another. Okay? And this is highly non well, it's fully non-perturbative, blah blah blah. Okay? So that's it. Thank you.